What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, and we are now another version of the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual studio by Dr. Vincent, I hope I don't abort his name, Pedre. Is that correct? You got it, man. <laughs> so let me give you guys Vincent's uh, background. Very awesome dude, incredible pedigree, medical director of Pedic. Pedre Integrative Health and founder of Dr. Pedre Wellness, which is a medical advisor to two health tech startups, Embody 360 and Fullscript. He's the chief medical officer for United Naturals and also very, very informed functional medicine certified practitioner in private practice in the hub of New York City. Since 2004, he's also certified in yoga and medical acup acupuncture. In 2017, he joined the orthomolecular as the chief clinical expert in the pillars of GI health program. And in 2018, he joined the faculty for the Institute for Functional Medicine, teaching the first ever introductory functional medicine courses to practitioners in Lima, Peru, and Brisbane, Australia, and also Mexico City. He believes the gut is the gateway to a better brain and excellent health. And he's also the best-selling author of Happy Gut, the cleansing program to help you lose weight, gain energy, and eliminate pain. And again, he's on the Jay Campbell podcast. So that gives him even a higher leg up, as I always do. Uh, when I start these podcasts, and you and I have some amazing talking points uh, to talk about today, but you know, how did Dr. Vincent Pedra get on the Jay Campbell podcast here today? Oh God, uh, what's my story? Uh, you know, I I could have never imagined that I would have ended up where I'm at today, uh, at multiple levels as an entrepreneur, as an influencer, a, a voice in in functional medicine. Uh, you know, growing up as a child, I was really thin when I went through my growth spurt, could never gain weight, was on multiple, multiple rounds of antibiotics. So like at least three rounds of antibiotics. My immune system was so shot right. that I used to get, I don't know if you know about these, uh, but they used to, back in the 80s, they used to give gamma globulin shots, which are I basically- remember them. Cool globulins, yeah, right. And if I wasn't clearing an infection, I would get pneumonia, I would get bronchitis, I would get wow. sinusitis, and I wasn't getting better with the antibiotic. Uh, my mom would take me into the doctor to get a gamma globulin shot, and every time I did, I felt great afterwards. But what everyone didn't know, you know, the pediatricians are like, he's not eating enough, or. I need to take a multivitamin, you know, this right. is the 80s. Yeah, back in the 80s, right. And then, and then, of course, I have two older sisters who are weight obsessed, and it's the, it, it was the fat is evil, but right. let me give you fat-free cookies right. full of sugar. sugar. Free. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, and so, you know, we were eating all the wrong things, and <laughs> as a result of being on all of these rounds of antibiotics, I mean, I can look back and, and say what happened to me is, I developed leaky gut. Right. And as a result of leaky gut, I became sensitive to the two most um, predominant food groups in my diet as a child, wheat and dairy. Sure. You know, I would start my day with cereal with milk, cereal right. probably laden with- General meals. <laughs> with like, you know, frosted flakes or something full of sugar. And I would end my school day with my mom taking me to one of those fast food restaurants on of the course. way home to pick up a vanilla milkshake, which I loved. Of course. But no one realized that what this was doing was destroying my immune system because yes. my gut microbiome had been decimated. It had been decimated. So almost selfishly, like my, my path initially as a teenager was I want to biohack my body and figure out why do I get sick three, right. four, five times a year? Like, 
and I see other kids and they're not getting sick like me. Like, what is going on? And that led me to, you know, probably over a decade long search to find the answers, you yeah. know, and little by little, I slowly uncovered because I went to a regular Western medical school. Sure, exactly. Yeah. They don't teach nutrition. I mean, barely no. any nutrition there. 101. <laughs> but like maybe, yeah. maybe one hour of nutrition for the four years of medical school. All purpose. And then, and then they're like, well, diet has no Not that big no of a deal. And yeah, it plays no role in your health. So, but okay. coincidentally, so this was, you know, I've always been kind of like a scientist mind. Sure. You know, and, and uh, just a keen observer, you know, and, and observing yourself is probably, you know, you can be the, you're, you're in, in many ways can be your most interesting data point because you're with yourself all the time. Right. And you know all the nuances of what happens in the day. So I had stopped drinking milk because I couldn't fit a cereal with milk in the morning. I had to run out to school. I was busy medical student. So my diet changed. And then I moved in with a roommate who was really into eating fat and avocado and olive oil. And I had never really incorporated healthy fats into my diet in that right. way. So my diet started changing. I started cooking at home and, and stopped having as much dairy. And the first thing I noticed was I'm not getting as sick as often. Right. And I was, you know, even though I wasn't learning any nutrition, I was like, hmm, you know, like I'm being an observer. Like, I wonder if there's something here because the one variable that changed, the big variable was less dairy. And another variable was incorporating more omega-3 rich fats into my diet. Hmm. And suddenly my immune system is back in line. How, and, old, were, how, old, how me, old were you? How old were you about this age? So this is like, this is like early twenties. Yeah. So this is around early twenties, but I was still suffering from kind of, uh, an irritable bowel and I had just grown, you know, you just kind of grow accustomed to this. You think like, this is my normal. This is how my life is going right. to be. Right. And at some point you're just like, well, my older sister has an iron stomach. Like she can go out and eat like, uh, uh, I don't know, let's say a chili and spice, spicy food and all, and she's like fine, like right. iron woman. And I would be sick to my stomach. So I'm just, you know, this is my matrix. This is right. the way I was created. And then I discovered functional medicine and started learning about the gut microbiome and started learning about the, um, the effects of wheat and gluten right. on the gut barrier. And then of course, uh, the effects of glyphosate and, um, non-organic uh, food and really little by little started shifting my diet towards organic produce, towards hormone-free, antibiotic-free meats. And my, my gut started feeling better. So what I thought I was going to have to live with for the rest of my life improved. Right. You know, so... So that's kind of like, that's, that's my story is like, I, I was patient number one or patient right. zero. Patient zero. That, and just out of the joy of working with people on their gut health issues, I became very curious about that because it was a huge mystery to me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't doing it to be a gut health expert. I wasn't doing it to write a book at the time. I was just doing it because... I was, I've always been kind of like a, a nerdy scientist and I'm like, well, kind of cool. Like if I give someone a probiotic and we manipulate their diet and we do this and that, like, and then they get better, like, that's really cool. Yeah. So I just started doing more of that. And one day I wake up and realize that I'm kind of like a semi gut expert. And why don't I write a book about this? Because... <laughs> I just keep getting people coming through my door who don't seem to know right. what to do. Right. So yeah. like, and I, and I, I was like, that's the tip of the iceberg. Well, that, I think it, I think it goes back to what you said earlier and what we said a little bit off the air, you know, that big pharma, the system, sick care, as I call it, they don't want people to understand the power of nutrition. You know, I, one of my mentors when I was in my early 20s said, Jay, what's the most powerful drug known to man? And, you know, my science brain is like, oh, well, let me start thinking about this. And 
you know, no one, you ask 99 medical doctors that question and 99, maybe 98 will get it wrong. And it's food. That's the answer. Yeah. Food is the most powerful drug because as you know, the cascade in human metabolism, we're all biochemically. Epi epigenetics, man. Like exactly. food controls gene Every, expression. Right. Exactly. But on the other end, food can be your greatest poison. Oh, well, it is. I mean, for most people, it is because of the crap that, you know, as you were eating as a kid, me too, all of us. I mean, you know, another, another statement I always say is like, if it's in a box, you probably shouldn't need it. You know, one of my good friends used to say, unless, it's, unless God made it, you shouldn't need it. I mean, it's honestly like stuff is so bad when it's, as you said, you know, inorganic created almost everything in a grocery store shelf today, even in the health food stores, right, is processed with oh, yeah. articulates. There's still, there's still a lot of packaged foods oh. there. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, some of the points. I want you to go. I want you to go deep on GMOs. Obviously, we were talking before that. There are so many people in the scientific community that still will debate people like me and you that GMOs are not harmful, that the science proves blah, blah, blah. You know, I always think of like corn and how they denatured corn to make high fructose corn syrup. Let's, let's, let's think about it. Let's think about it this way. So we've got the 25% of the earth's biodiversity, 25% is found within the first foot of soil. Right. And because of mono, monoculture and because of, you know, the, the wide use of pesticides, right. we're about 65 years away from losing all farmable soil. That's crazy, man. You know, because, cause, and, and, and I, I, I love talking about the soil because to me, the soil is like the guts of the earth. Right, it is. It has... It has a very rich microbiome. Like you see a, a living soil, it's got earthworms, it's right. full of bugs, right. it's full of bacteria. Now take the soil sample from a field that has been sprayed multiple, multiple times with glyphosate. Yeah. What does that soil sample look like? It's bad. It's got, it, it's had a shift in its microbiome. It has unfavorable bacteria growing in that soil. It's lost its diversity. And that's something I always speak about is the importance of diversity because diversity is what creates robustness in, in life, but it's also diversity in the types of bacteria that populate your gut is what creates a robust um, ecosystem that then allows you to balance a lot of metabolic processes in your body, including your sugar metabolism. Right. You know, so glyphosate, is patented as an antibiotic. It's a chelating agent. And what it does is it, 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 it basically it's killing off good bacteria in the soil. The way it kills weeds is by starving them of nutrients. But even the plants that are being grown from that soil are going to be devoid of nutrients. Like if you look at the nutrient profile of vegetables, like the, the, in the last 50 years, the amount of calcium, magnesium, uh, iron in vegetables has dropped dramatically. Yeah. Like some like yeah. 50%. So let me ask you a crazy question about it then. And this is so off the radar, but you know, you're feeling your energy and feeling where you're going with this. Who is behind the destruction of the planet? Is it just corporations? Is it indirectly? Is this indirect? Or is there really a bigger overarching power or force outside of like what we understand that's architecting a new world, you know, you can say, that, you know, the cliche new world order, but are, are they trying to create some sort of a transhumanist, non-biological world where, you know, you will have to become somewhat artificial or synthetic to even breathe, to even eat, to even exist? I think I mean, it's, I think it's, a, it's is, a serious question and it's important. I, I think the thing is that the, you know, what we see is financial interest get in the way and, and greed. Yeah. And in place of thinking, what is for the greatest good? Like I've always heard, and I think this is from, I think this might be American Indians, maybe Cherokee, right. that when they would make a decision, they would, the elders would meet and they would think about 
how will this decision affect us? Right. How will it affect our children? Pacha how Mala will it Earth. affect our children's children? Right. And we don't have enough of that psychology right no. now. No. Well, the you just said it. I mean, and, and I'll add something, you know, in my specialty with hormones, they also know that by the year 2040, the male species will be unable to propagate. We will not be fertile as males through, you know, testosterone, through uh, fertility, FSH, well, LH. There, I mean, there's, there's about 80,000 chemicals that have been introduced in the U.S. since the early 1900s. That's insane. And we know that only 10% of them have been tested for human safety. Right. A lot of these chemicals, right. I'm sure you talk about this, are yep. endocrine disrupting chemicals yep. that act like estrogen. Absolutely. And every year they're still introducing 2,000 new chemicals. This book is, that's the gold standard book about all that, Estro Generation by Dr. Anthony J. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, no, I mean, yeah, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, we can go so many different directions in this. I'm glad you're, we're talking about this, but I mean, but where are we going? Are, are, I mean, I'm, it's an opinion question for you, but I mean, are we heading this toward- is, I want to go back to your question because yeah. there, there's so many tangentials, right. even around GMOs. Like we talk about what is causing climate change. Right. No one's really talking about the effect of glyphosate and the effect on the soil and releasing uh, methane, nitrogen, right. methane right. into the air right. that is, is a, I think like 30, 40 times more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Right, right. But so I mean, we have to think that this monoculture is actually a big instigator of climate change. Right. You know, so just talking bigger picture. Right. Because and, and but the crazy thing is, is that there are ways that we could feed the population of the earth using organic techniques. Like we right. don't have to do this. Right. Right. No, absolutely. Well, that's my bigger question to you. You know, are we extinguishing slash extincting ourselves? I mean, you could make a very tangential argument that that is where we're headed, you know, with all the bad things you know, and we're not even talking about current day, right? I mean, like this podcast is June Look, 11th. We, 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 <laughs> went on a par we went on a paradigm, right? right. We, we, we went on this paradigm that we're going to make things better. We can bioengineer these crops. Right. Uh, we're going to make them abundant, weather resistant. But what we lost in that paradigm is that part of what makes us human and right. robust right. and resilient is variety. Exactly. It is the diversity in the right. food supply. You know what's really remarkable, Jay? Uh, I went, I, I don't have you ever been to Machu Picchu? Of course, dude. This is all straight up from there, literally hand oil paintings. I was there for oh, 13 man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see that one over there. I recognize from, <laughs> yeah. from, from Cusco. So, you know. Cusco. It's my favorite place, by the way, in the whole world. Oh, uh, I have to say that Cusco, Cusco has a special place in my heart. Yeah. Uh, there's, it's just special energy there. Energy, yeah. But, but you know what the, you know what the Incas were doing in Machu Picchu and those terraces. They were, they were weather adapting plants right. from the Amazon to the higher elevations. Right. But really, they were also hedging their bets because some of the plants more were resistant to drought. Other ones thrived in other weather, but they had this big diversity. I mean, right. Peru has one of the, I think, like I was talking about the, the earth's biodiversity, mm -hmm. that 25% in the soil, well, 25% of all the biodiversity on the earth is in Peru. Uh, and that's probably why the ancient builders, you know, that were there, knew, they knew that obviously from, from, from an awareness perspective. I mean, they, they, have, they have over a hundred different varieties of corn, hundred different varieties yeah. of yeah. potatoes they even have a potato that's called the anti-viagra what is they, that i never even heard have of a that. potato called the anti-viagra hmm. that they would feed to um people they conquered to dosify the men wow yeah they would make oh, a soup out of this potato and feed it to them <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. I did not know that. Peru is unbelievable. I see. I knew I told you. I saw I felt your energy. So we both had that same like a blow up of like energy being in Peru. I was actually just there last year in July. So it's almost been a full year that I was there. But it, I mean, I, my, I, I honestly energetically 
transcended. All right, let's get back to some of the stuff we're talking about though, because I want to obviously share, you know, your, your wisdom and stuff. Um, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. I think we, we've hit, you know, gut dysregulation and immune and, and, you know, I mean, I'll ask you one question just and you just bit broad picture answer it. I mean, I know your answer, but I want to ask it just to the audience because I've said this before, but is pretty much every single disease ideology of today, not everyone, but the majority, there's outliers, of course, really come from an infected microbiome. So just again, like not eating the right foods. Or like a dysbiotic microbiome, right. like an imbalance. Right. Uh, you can say that a lot of disease starts in the gut. Yeah. I would say probably the majority of disease, including autoimmune disease, absolutely starts in the gut. Inflammation is linked right. to the gut. Weight right. gain is linked to the gut. Uh, you know, there's the gut brain axis. Right. There, there are things that might, you know, once they get to the brain, have to be dealt with in the brain itself. Right. Uh, but I think. Aside from that, most illnesses right. have a commonality of a gut problem Absolutely. that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. And few address it, right? Because again, the average Western person is drinking too much alcohol, eating too much sugar, has a systemic inflammation because of the lack of exercise, the lack of weight training, the lack of blank movement patterning. Yeah, so it all, it all piles up. I, I do want to get in with you with the mind, body, spirit medicine, because um, obviously I'm mm. huge into that. Um, you know, one of your points or one of our talking points is how working at those three levels is required to achieve healing at a deep restorative level. And then of course, the role of meditation and mindfulness. But before you answer, I put a tweet up. I'm really big on, on Twitter. I put a tweet up yesterday about trauma and unintegrated soul spiritual trauma and how right now, and it's perfectly relevant. And by the way, again, I say it, you know, this, this podcast is done on, in June right now, June 11th, and it might not run because of my funnel until later in the year. So I always want people to know that, you know, to, to share your awareness and stuff like that. But uh, I feel right now, Vincent, that we're, the, the, this is the collective dark night of the soul for humanity right now. Like a lot of people are being faced to handle their fears, to handle their shame, to handle, again, their trauma which as you know, the majority of people do none of the things that you and I do, which is again, meditation, contemplation, mindfulness, ground plan, all those things. And so when you lack that inner game, as I call it, that mindfulness game, you can't handle this insanity, right? Because as you and I both agree, well, it's the best description is just insanity. Mo you know, what, what most people do is they drink it away, they right. eat it away, exactly. they, they get into petty arguments with right. friends, loved right. ones, Right. You know, they use all sorts of distractions to not deal with right. the true thing that is under underlying everything. Right. So to that point, yes. So to that point, talk about that. How important is the inner game? Oh, man. You know, I've been a doctor now for over 20 years. You know, so I've seen a lot of things. I've seen people through a lot of different issues and obviously people come to me with the physical complaint uh, but when I'm working with a person I'm not just working with the physical because you can't separate the mind from the physical and ultimately if you believe in it you maybe you don't maybe you do uh, if you believe in the spirit level you can't separate that energetic level from everything and I think that there are you know there are different levels to healing because there can be collective healing that needs to happen. And, and right now in society, it's obviously a very poignant point, um, time in, in, in our history where there needs to be collective healing exactly. that happens. Uh, exactly. But there's also individual healing, there's family circle healing. And, and really what it comes down to is diving into those uncomfortable feelings. Right, right. right. And instead of running away from them, allowing yourself to feel it at, at such a deep level. And, and I, I, I struggle sometimes to find the language for this because a lot of people live out there expressing their feelings, thinking about their feelings. Right. But being in the headspace about your feelings is not the same thing as actually feeling them right at a physical, visceral level. Because a lot of times if you ask people, where is your anger? Where is your sadness? 
they're not going to point to their head. Exactly. They're going to say their sadness is here. It feels heavy on the chest. Right, right. Where they're, or that their anger is like a knot in their stomach. Absolutely. Well, that's where you need to feel it in order to heal. Exactly. You know, you need to feel it in order to release it. I can't tell you how many times th this has happened over and over. I have seen someone lose a significant loved one who they had unresolved issues with. Exactly. And right after that, they get a lung infection and a severe pneumonia. I right. have seen people or almost cancer. die. Yeah, or cancer. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen people almost die from this. It's totally and true. And the, the interesting thing is in Chinese medicine, which I, I dabbled in a little bit, uh, the lungs is the seat of the emotions and especially sadness. So right. if, you, if you have unresolved sadness, it can really condense in the lungs. And I've seen people get sick. Um, I had a friend who almost died after her mom died, who she did, she did not have a good relationship with. And her mom died from, I believe, a lung issue. And she, then her, the daughter almost died from a lung issue right after that. She was in the intensive care and everything. And it's, you have to deal with your shit. You can't yeah, run exactly. away from it. It's basically that. Like you, and, and you've got to be, you know, I see that you're uh, an evolved soul. I can, I can detect that. And I think that has to happen at all levels. I think, um, I think that's a great example for, for men because men in our society need to, need to heal, not, not just women. But when I say that, I mean that we have to get out of that macho consciousness and be able to connect with our emotions, our feelings, acknowledge them and release whatever is held inside that is negative, that is tearing you down, that makes you act out, do things that are, are wrong and bad for society, you know? And, and I talk about that, you know, it's funny, you know, we're, I'm a gut health doctor, but to me, you've got to heal every, if you really want to heal, right. like you can do superficial healing. We can sure. do healing at different levels. Right. If you want, to be fully healed, your life actualized, you wake up in the morning and you feel like you are living the life that you want, you're choosing the career that you want, you have to heal at all these levels. Absolutely, man. I gotta be honest with you, brother. I have not done a podcast because my, my, my thing is so jacked up right now. Like I have so many people in my funnel. Something told me to do a podcast with you. We are very, very like-minded. We are, we are uh, as you said, evolved soul. I love that. But we, we come from a very similar spiritual cloth. And what you said about men is so true. You, you know, the, one of my spiritual mentors told me that we have, as human beings, we really only have two purposes. And that is to give and to receive love. And when you give and receive love on a daily basis as a human being, then you are meeting all of the you know, psycho-spiritual metaphysical quotients that we have as a soul because where I've gotten to in my knowing is that these, as you, and you know this, but for the audience, you know, these bodies are just rentals. These are just avatar physical bodies at a psycho-spiritual level. We're nothing more than energy. You know, our spirit, our soul, worrying electrons, plasmatic fire, however you want to see it. But you, know, you talked about the Incas, you know, the, the indigenous of Mesoamerica you know, knew that all life was conscious and all life was sentient. And so they preached and worshiped and respected and revered the rocks, the trees, the water, the mountains, the winds, you know, just as much as they did actual life, you know, like their dogs and their cats and the panther and the mountain lion and the, and the you know, the, the, the spirit. And I the love condor. that. You know, the, the three levels, <laughs> right? Course, right. The, exactly. the three levels of the Incas, the underworld, this world, and the yes. celestial world. Yes, exactly. And, and so anyway, to, to what you were saying and to what I'm saying is, yes, we must face these traumatic experiences head on. You know, we all have them. It's not like, you know, some of us to get to where we are didn't, didn't have to deal with them. And, and, you know, the people in my audience, they know my story, Doc. I, I, I had to face economic collapse, losing my children, being put in jail, losing everything, including my ego. And then, you know, I was lucky and blessed enough that I was willing to go down the path of 5-MEO and do plant medicine and release everything that I released. And 
so ever since all that stuff okay. happened to me in my life, I, my, my, you know, I was like on this journey, but most people, and you said, especially men, because men are conditioned in our society to just rub some dirt on it. Keep going, bro. You know, you're a man, you can't emote, you can't be, you can't let yeah. people see you, you know, you know, weak, right? You said yeah. it. Yeah, we need, we need to be raising, and I, I've, I've thought about this a lot because my, my dad was very macho. And my dad you know, still is. Old, he's 74, old, he's a maniac. <laughs> old Cuban, old Cuban macho, you know? And like, yeah. I remembered him telling me, you don't cry. Exactly, dude. Yeah. You don't cry. And what happened as a result, you know, so this is, you know, we can always weave in other stories sure. with my gut health. I internalized my yes, feelings. You did. you did. Because I didn't think it was, you know, I was told it's not right allowed for, to for a guy to externalize them. Yeah. So I kept everything in. And here I am as an aware dad who's done um, a lot of work over of the course, years, you've done the you work, know. Doc. You've done the and, work. And and I was gonna say, you know, like the like you mentioned, the dark night of the soul, like it takes a ton of pressure of right. of dark carbon to create a diamond. That's exactly right. You know, so so thankfully, you know, I've I've always raised my son from the place of it's okay to cry. Of course. And and many times that uh, he's cried, I've actually just gone over, hugged him, and just whispered in his ear, it's okay to cry. Absolutely, that's awesome, man. And I think that's what we gotta teach. You know, if we could do that, so much healing would happen in the world. Totally. You know, if we could just, uh, you know, get men to accept their emotions, Doc, and be you able know, to express you know them in a profound. safe way. But do you know how What's profound that? that is that what you did for your son? So you stopped this right there is when you stopped the trans personal transgenerational trauma that you inherited from your father. So that's the whole sins of the father. You put a stop to it right there. So your son's soul energy and spirit is going to, I mean, imagine how much he's going to be able to like now give to his offspring and to the people that he meets in his life. Cause you stopped it right there. And again, that's all, you know, I, I have, 150 books on transgenerational trauma over to my right right now that I read religiously. You know, I'm writing my book now, which is called Raising Your Vibration. And it's, I hope we have an entire, my wife's writing it with me. I, I, I'm very blessed. My wife is very aware too. But uh, we have a whole chapter on this, on how to deal with things you and I have been talking about, you know, face to face, head on. And then actual, you know, transparent, tangible solutions for people because as you know dude most guys are going to look at you and me and we're going to be like these you guys are too woo woo I, I have no idea what you're talking about you know i don't understand any of that and that's fine you know you're at your level where you're at right now you know i always always use the hawk and scale if you're familiar there's with the the, there's the pre-aware level you know right the, right where you don't even know that there is a problem <laughs> how about this comment most but, but, people are unconscious of their unconsciousness yeah <laughs> Yeah, and and look, I I live there. I was there at, at, at one us. point, yeah. but I've always, I you know, I think, you know, the way that you end up in in these places in life, which I think is is important, is to you know to always be seeking exactly and thinking, you know, is is what my belief system now that has created the structure of my life and my health as it is which maybe is not perfect is my belief system correct or does there some is there some shift that needs to happen in it that if it did Beautiful. could my life be something different that's awesome you know so so ultimately for me you know which is crazy as a doctor like my my greatest joy is not just getting people to be healthy it's to see them actualize their lives you know, so, and, and I'll give you an example, like I had a patient came in, she was not feeling great. And I'm very intuitive. I go in, I'm like, what's going on at work? She's like, I'm miserable at work. Right. This is not what I want to do. I'm like, okay, so what do you want to do? And I'm like, okay, so then let's create a dream board. We're going to manifest. She's like, well, this and that. And I've been interviewing. I'm like, no, 
you're going to very clearly think about what it is that you want in your life because your life happiness affects everything else, including how you feel in your body. Beautiful. And she came back two or three months later, manifested a dream job she never thought she could have gotten, feeling great, super grateful to me, healthy, you know, and able to now consciously make the right decisions for her health because she's in a place that is supportive of who she is. You know, so everything to me is integrated. Everything matters. 100%. 100%. I mean, that's so awesome, man. We have such a like mind. I mean, it's all quantum physics. That which is focused upon is given. And as you know, and it's perfect out in analogy right now with the, you know, this mass pain and trauma of all these people, you know, I call it the victimhood vibration. It's like, they're all focused on their anger or the cops are bad or racism or all this other stuff that's just created. that's external and nothing internal. Cause as you said, very many times elegantly that no one's facing themselves. It's like, we have that right now. And if you would just focus on what you want, and what you can have, you know, obviously, and I, as I always say that you conscious words, focused thoughts, I, I, massive I, loving actions. That's how you get it. I will say, you know, from being uh, the youngest of three kids, um, I, I learned the victim role very well. Of course. Uh, I, really, I really learned how to play it up. And, <laughs> and the funny thing is, you know, I, at some, at somewhere... It was probably like seven years ago or so I claimed my victim. Nice, man. I woke up and became aware and realized that I was playing the victim. I was playing the victim in my former marriage. Uh, you know, it was like she was doing everything to me and, and it was, none of it was my fault. Right. And when you decide that what is my role in creating the reality that exists around me, you know, it is, it is super empowering, but also really interesting as a mirror to then now see my son struggling and playing the victim at times. And it's just kind of, you know, it's like a mirror up to me, like, well, this is what you used to do, you know? And I think we all need help, you know? It's, I think it's almost like, it's very natural in our society to go to the place of victim but it's a place of, of not, it's not empowerment, you know? So for me, like, I always try to teach people like, you know, let's first acknowledge, you know, that you're being a, a if you're, if you're feeling a uh, victim and this is nothing to say about, you know, what's happened because it's, it's tragic what we know what happened uh, in <laughs> when we were recording this episode right. especially last week was quite right. a quite a heated it was so so intense that as an empath i was feeling it oh I yeah feel i feel it right now i feel i, I feel, feel the it. energy right now still there's still so much dissonance in the air but all, all the things you've said are profound and i'm glad we went down this path because i don't get a lot of people to talk about this kind of stuff i will go back to one last question or, or talking point that we had which is the best diets for achieving gut health. And, mm. you know, I'm, I'm really big on metabolic flexibility. You know, in yeah. my latest book, you know, I talk about living a fully optimized life. I talk about that that's more important than anything else that, you know, if you, you can use any type of diet, so to speak, or, you know, energetic fuel construct, whether it's ketones, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, again, autophagy, hormesis from fasting, or it's low carbohydrates, suppression of insulin, whatever. The bottom line is, is you said it earlier in the, in the podcast is that we have to keep the body guessing. The body wants to return to stasis always. And so yeah. if you fixate on one specific path, like so many people do, you know, and again, I'm not judging, but in the ketosis realm where it's like, I got to maintain ketosis or I got to be a vegan. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I, I want you to talk about like, you know, your thoughts on metabolic flexibility and really just your thoughts on, on all of the various diets and how, you know, if there is a specific type of eating path to maximize gut health. Yeah. I mean, first of all, um, it can depend on how sick the person is in their gut. Sure. Uh, because 
I could say, you know, the blanket statement, you know, eat from the earth, eat right. a lot of plant-based <laughs> foods. Right. But you can't eat a lot of raw vegetables if your gut is a mess because exactly. your gut is not going to have the digestive enzyme strength right. to break down those foods. Right. So in those cases, you've got to eat more cooked vegetables and, and maybe, you know, and, and sometimes it's been a struggle, but on occasion having to take a vegan and get them to start becoming a bit more flexible about incorporating some animal protein uh, because it's such more, it's such a more efficient source of amino acids. And a lot of times they start feeling so much better. Um, and I've seen also uh, women start losing weight when they incorporate some more protein into the diet. Uh, whereas they thought they were being healthy, eating all vegetarian right. and bringing right. in a little bit of animal protein, whether it's fish. Um, but I do believe that a, a cyclical diet is, is important, like you were talking about metabolic flexibility. Um, you know, I, I think the way I eat and the, and the way I think people should eat is eat eat for your microbiome, but also eat for the way that you want to feel. I, was, I love that, by the way, eat for your microbiome. I'm writing that down. Eat for your microbiome and, and eat for the way you want to feel. If you want to feel great, then eating that big plate of lasagna when you go out to eat and having then a tiramisu dessert is probably not going to leave you feeling great afterwards. But, but, but you just, you, dude, you just killed it. You don't even realize how bad you, I mean, how this is positive. You killed it in a good way. You, you, you remember what you said earlier in the show about people lacking the character resolve, fortitude, whatever, to deal with the internal. How is a person going to actually know what makes them feel good? When they don't have that self-check already or that you know internal determinism to figure out what it is, because I would just argue with you, and I'm not debating you because it's an awesome comment, but I would just say to you, the majority of people think that feeling good is eating a donut because they're yeah. hungry. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they're not even thinking about blood sugar and spiking insulin. Somet sometimes what I, what I do for, with people uh, on that and, and with my patients one-on-one -on -one is I tell them, well, you know, tell me, how did it feel having that donut? Right. Oh, it felt great. I love the, the chocolate icing, the creaminess. And, and I'm like, well, how did you feel five minutes later? Exactly. And like, and how did you feel 10 minutes later? They're like, hmm, how about 30 minutes later? I didn't feel so good. Right. How did you feel an hour later? Oh, I didn't, I felt like I needed to go take a nap. Right. So, so what you're telling me is you're sacrificing how you feel over a much broader period of time for that small blip right. of pleasure. Right. You know, and it's, and to me, it, it's, it's always been a, a debate because I can be kind of a hard ass. <laughs> at no, times. I hope so. <laughs> and, you know, I tell people where, if, if you're, if you're creating a priority list, where is your health on that priority? Exactly. Is your health here and the donut is here? Right. Or is your health here? Because if your health is put at the highest priority, then the decision that you make, the decisions that you make are not about deprivation. Right. They're not about not eating the donut. They're a decision in favor of feeling great and feeling the best that you can feel. And then it's not it's not coming from a place like, oh, I can't have that donut. Right. It's a right. temptation. It's exactly. more like, hey, I'm choosing not to have this donut or this cookie or this ice cream because I know how I'm going to feel after this. And I want to feel great. Exactly. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that, you know, that's, that's something that, that like mental framing that I use with people. Uh, and it works for some, for others, you know, they cave in and to their cravings, but it's always coming from an emotional place. You know what, right. you know, what's really interesting for me. And I don't know if you like, I, I, I think there have been many gifts of the quarantine that we had to go through. And uh, for me, running a crazy schedule, seeing patients in New York, traveling across the country this year, I was already in Africa. Wow. and Mexico and Maui. Wow. Uh, so I had traveled all over the place. 
And then suddenly I was grounded. And what I found was I started meditating regularly. I started doing a yoga routine every day. I started going on runs since I couldn't go to the gym. Right. And I started really tuning into like eating when I'm hungry. And I realized that there was even as much as I'm a model and, and a role model for people that when I was in this heavy duty, stressed out schedule, there was sometimes 10 PM cravings that I would of course. give into, yeah. you know, and all of it went away. So, you know, so as we, uh, I don't know how far we are, I think we're pretty far in, but um, as we get to a close, I think what, what it made me realize is the powerful effect that stress has on us yeah. and an indolent because you may think you're a person who handles stress really well, but I call it like, maybe you're not psychologically stressed, but your body is biophysically stressed Sure. by having to wake up early, by having to rush to work, by having to deal with the commute, by having to travel for work, getting on airplanes, going to airports. That's all biophysical stressors. Sure. Even if your mind doesn't feel stressed about it, your body is registering it as stress. Exactly. And that's one thing, like taking all of that away during quarantine, it's to me, it's one of the gifts of quarantine is realizing, wow, like all this was having an effect. Yeah. And, and, it, and it took not being in it for you to like go internal and to really examine it and recognize that, again, it's a choice. As I always tell people when I'm mentoring people or talking to people, it's like everything that we do is a choice. You know, it's like have that self-introspective moment, whatever it is, don't label it as negative I, or good, right? Just come from a I gotta tell you, I, I got to tell you a funny story about that. Sure. <laughs> uh, I tell my son that like, you can choose to be this or you can choose to be that. And he's like, dad, you make it sound so easy, but it's not easy. And, <laughs> and it is in many ways, you know, us as our aware, uh, mature right. men, like we realize it is that easy. You it just to make a decision right. that you're going to think this way. But then I tell him, I'm like, well, do you want me to teach you master ninja <laughs> mental techniques? Or do you want me to just teach you the basic stuff? And he's like, no, I want you to teach you mas me master ninja mind techniques. And I'm like, okay. Then you choose the way you want, you know, what your choice is how your life is, the way you approach your day. That's exactly right. It's awesome, man. It's funny. I'll, I'll just give you a quick story and then we'll end the show. You can tell people how to work with you. Um, that tweet that I put up yesterday about collective trauma, I got so many people messaging me and say, but I, how can you help me? Can you do a video or a podcast on it? You know, and I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll bring a guy on. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to somebody about it. And here you come. The universe <laughs> just comes right the, as you know, the universe never, there's no coincidence in the universe when you are focused on the right things, it delivers. And you just literally, like I said, I, I, it was something about you. I just knew to do the podcast and you just came in and you gave me so many ideas. And honestly, I, in the next hour, I'm going to do probably a five or six minute video to answer the, a bunch of these people's questions. And I'm going to share a lot of the stuff that we just gained from this podcast, which has been absolutely phenomenal, man. I really appreciate you coming on. So if people, when they watch this. Thank you, man. Thank yeah, you. of course, brother. No, absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to get your cell phone number after the show too. But um, if people want to work with you, connect with you, buy your stuff, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, go check out happygutlife.com. That's uh, where I've got my 28-day happy gut cleanse. Uh, they can also check out um, through United Naturals. I've um, helped engineer uh, two products that are excellent, Symbiotic 365. And Gut Connect 365, which is our leaky gut formula, which nice. I helped formulate. Um, and I think it's one of the best uh, formulas on the market for that. Um, and then, of course, um, Instagram, at Dr. Pedre on Instagram. I'm constantly putting out uh, stuff that people can share, save, uh, um, educate, elevate, and uh, help people live healthiest life they can live. It's awesome, man. And it's a choice, right? <laughs> it's a choice, but you know, it takes some suffering to get to the point where you realize that it's all a choice. 
you know, like my, like my friend who was an alcoholic and now is sober would tell me this story. Like when does there, there's a dog, there's a, there's a, one of those uh, hounds on a porch and his owner is on a rocking chair. And every time he rocks back, it rocks onto the tip of his tail and the dog goes, Whoa! right. And, and he's like, when does it, when does the dog move? Cause the dog just stayed there. He's like, when will the dog move? Well, when it hurts enough. Right. Exactly. You know, and sometimes you've got to get to that point where the things in your life hurt enough that you decide that's it. I've got to make a change. It's beautiful. You know, my, my wife's uh, father who I'm very close to um, 37 years sober. And his comment is people won't change until they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. Yeah. That's the same and thing you said. My, my goal is to save people before they get to that point, you right. know, like, right. like right. see down the road and I'm like, this is where you're going. Do you really want that? Or you could change trajectory now. It's much easier. Uh, but you know, everybody's on their path. Exactly. I'm not here to tell somebody to live their life a different way. I'm just here to guide them. My, my goal is just to be a light, a lighthouse and just be like, this is the way. And if you choose to, you can come this way, but if you're not ready, then fine. That's you're in, in your place and you will come to what, whatever awareness, understanding at the time that's right for you. Beautiful, man. So guys, please, as always on this podcast, support the amazing people that come on. Dr. P Pedre, Dr. Vincent Pedre is an amazing guy. His website is happygutlife.com. If you've listened to this podcast, you know what kind of an aware being he is. So again, support him. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.